Hey, welcome to the Wet Stuff Podcast, our uh, Sunday speakeasy. I'm here with Caitlin Padilla, uh, my my host of the Wet Stuff Podcast, and I am Katie Neely, and uh, we're just we're just going to chat for a little minute. Yes, yes, we are. It's Sunday night, 9 p.m. Mountain. That's when Sunday Speakeasy happens, and it's kind of a wrap up of our week and the challenges and sometimes foibles that have happened over the week and what we've accomplished and kind of setting ourselves up for the next week and what what we hope to accomplish the next week. Tonight, we are not joined by Morgan, our other co-host, Morgan Frail. Um, Frail? Morgan Farley? Farley. Farley, I'm sorry. Morgan Farley. I'm sorry, Morgan. That's okay. You dyslexinated his name. I did. Ah. Uh, <laughs> he is uh, not with us this evening, and he, he is missed very much, but he will be joining us again next week. So tonight, um, we're going to jump in and kind of talk about the, the life as an artist and um, how frequently it's, it's a solitary venture and um, we don't, uh, for many of us, we choose not to work with people a lot of the time. Um, yeah. You know, being, being, or it's, it's not even like, I wouldn't say it's a choice. It's like, you're, you're doing your work and because you're doing your work, you're not, there's other things you're not doing. Right. And most of us are doing our work in isolation. Sure. Well, um, and this would be an interesting thing to talk to Morgan about too, because as a musician, typically, oh, you need to you need to work on like it's the opposite. Like right. when, when you're doing well, there's like solo practice, and then there's band practice, right? right. So with, like with musicians, like you're you're it, it's part of it is that you you are part of an ensemble and you do work as a group, and I yeah. think as um, you know, fine artists, painters, you know, um, wall art, craft type stuff, you, you are typically, it's your art. You don't, unless, unless you're specifically doing a collaboration, you're, you're working alone. And, and for many of us being entrepreneurs and starting our own businesses, you know, we are our own bosses. We are, which is great in a lot of ways, because who wants a fucking boss? Um, but at the same time, you kind of get um, isolated and um, aren't aren't used to having to negotiate or or work with other people in in that kind of ensemble setting. So it's challenging. Yeah. Well, I think what happens is. Um while you're in your zone, in your happy place, you're not being met with having to deal with the challenges of everyday life. You still have those challenges, like you're still facing them, but we really get an escape when we do our work, you know? Oh, definitely. Definitely it's, it's the outside the world work, kind of the, goes away. Like doing the work itself is totally therapeutic. Definitely. I, I can't say it enough that, that art is, is therapy. And, and I think that um, when you, you can work out so much stuff emotionally or um, intellectually or, you know, all of those things through, through your art creation. And I think that definitely for you know, the, the type and the style and the, the content of the art that both you and I do being metaphysical art and, you know, surrealism and stuff like that. There's a lot of meat to that. And it's obvious that you're imbuing, Im, imbuing, is that the right word? With, <laughs> with a lot of emotion and a lot of, of concepts and, and story and, there, there are many of your pieces, especially that I've seen where you're definitely tackling big um, emotions and big concepts and, you know, 
working through these questions that we have. And so, you know, you get in, you get in your head and you get in that zone. And yeah. a lot of times, a lot of times the uh, outside world uh, goes away. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I think it also depends on what other work you do. Like for most of us making artwork is a side gig. Um, it, not a side gig in the sense of um, like not taking it seriously. I don't mean like a hobby, but I, not that people don't take their hobbies seriously. But um, I think that forgot what I was going to say. Well, being, being like thinking that, that for a lot of artists, it's a a side gig and, and I think. Oh, so it depends on what you do in your other work. That's where I was going with it. That's all right. Yeah. (laughs) As as to how developed your people skills end up getting. Cause like, I know I've been obsessed with like art making and being in the zone since I was a child. In fact, not being able to get along with the other kids is why I ended up making artwork for the first time. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, we were playing house. I was in kindergarten and um, they wanted me to be the mom in the house. So they, I, I wanted to be the fireman. I liked the hat. It was this big red plastic hat. And I had the fireman's hat on and I was going, woo, woo, woo. And I was putting imaginary fires out around the classroom and the kids, the other kids like grouped up and like had to stop me for some reason. And they were like, no, you're, you're a girl. You can't be a fireman. That's what they said. Hmm. And they took the fireman's hat away from me and they said, you be the mom in the kitchen. And they pushed me into the kitchen. And I remember looking at this like sheet of cookies, like with, the cookies were stickers on the cookie sheet. And I was like, this is useless. <laughs> wow. That's, that's really interesting that I don't think there was anything wrong with your people skills. I think that the kids you were playing with were like trying to make you conform to. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, it was totally the kids getting together and telling me to conform to wow. the list of jobs for her and the list of jobs for him. Right. Oh, that's messed up. Oh, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I do think uh, that, that with, with um, artists and like their, their kind of other, roles in in the outside world of art i think that for many artists we come from different you know professional backgrounds or different skill sets or different because i've met artists that that were you know more in like the the engineering side of things and artists that you know did did a lot of different things in their in their quote professional lives before or during when they were um, artists, like for for me, I managed movie theaters, and um, I was an elementary school teacher for a while. But at a certain point, and and this is interesting too, because I think that um, the pandemic kind of did this for a lot of people. I know quite a few artists who have had um, other forms of income that wasn't specifically their art and have now decided through you know examining things through the pandemic that like i don't want to be doing these other things i don't want art to be my side gig i want it to be my my main thing and i want to just make that i don't want to work for somebody stupid i don't want to work in an office anymore and put all of this energy and effort into something i'm not passionate about and And it's come about in two ways On one hand, there's a small percentage of people whom it's a luxury for Mm. that they that they are now presented with what 
what really is an opportunity to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you have people who are forced to be entrepreneurs because everything else has been taken away from them. That's true. That's true. And, and coming at it in, in, you know, from those different angles and, um, you know, I know for myself, I was very lucky and very privileged to be able to decide to, to just do my art and have that be my main source of income. And that has been what I've done since, um, 2016. That's when I, I decided, nope, I'm only going to be an artist and that's what my income is going to be. And that's, that's it. I don't have, I don't have any other side gigs and that's my, my only, my only income is from being an artist. And I'm very lucky that I was able to have the financial security to kind of abandon my job that, that was a regular paycheck that had benefits tied to it. And I was lucky to be able to have financial support in order to be able to start that early stages where you don't make anything, where you basically are just schlepping stuff and, you know, busking and, and selling your, hawking your wares on the side of the street. So yeah, it, it takes a while to build that up and to actually have an income from it. And granted, I still don't make nearly as much money as, as I would like to. And I, I definitely am in a position where I am contributing to the income, but I am not carrying the entire income for the household. So I, if it was just me, I would live in a box probably. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I mean, I, again, I'm very grateful that I'm able to do that. And it's, it's definitely given me the ability to do those beginning stages and have those years of struggling without having the stress of losing my home, which I know for a lot of people, that is a huge inhibitor for being able to take that step and saying, like, I want yeah. to, I'm going to be a professional artist because unfortunately you can't just make the switch and everybody buys your art. Right. right. And there's no health insurance and there's no pension plan. And, you know, there's no job security in, in being, a solo professional artist, which is unfortunate. I mean, you can have those things though, with a, with certain, after a certain point it's possible, but you still have to go through that period. Like you said, where you have to build those things from the ground up. Right. Right. And that's tough. And, and it's very, very scary to, to take that leap and, and decide, you know, to, to put your passion, to take the risk and put your passion over, um, having an income. <laughs> so, and, and it's something that a lot of people can't do, but I think again, like during the pandemic, I've known quite a few people who have um, taken that leap and just decided, you know what, I am already putting so much energy into this other thing that is not providing me. Yeah, maybe it's some money, but if I took my energy that I'm putting in that and put it into my own passion, I know that I would be making the same amount of money given a little time. And, and the pandemic has afforded us the ability to work from home, um, you know, the, the, we don't have to spend as much money. A lot of people we're not filling our cars up as much. And so there's a little bit more wiggle room for some people to do that. Yeah. So, I mean, it also helps when you can actually find work in your field as an artist to, you know, that that's not necessarily your personal 
you know, you painting and then directly selling those paintings, but it is finding, in, finding a job that gets you in the zone that, right. util, that utilizes your creativity. It doesn't try to, doesn't, doesn't try to settle you down or push on your creativity or inhibit you in any way, but right. instead takes advantage of the fact that you're creative. Right. And, and, you know, using it in different, in different ways. And, um, you know, like I know that you're, you're able to kind of, um, stretch your creative chops in, in your job with the Corrales comment. And you have, um, you know, that's in, in the vein of, of creativity. And so that's really great. Yeah. Yeah. I got lucky there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. And I, I have been lucky also to, to get a contract doing exactly what I want to be doing. I'm, I'm connecting the artistic community with resources and with other members of the artistic community to kind of help the, um, our culture and our creative economy in Albuquerque, which is something that I'm very passionate about. And I'm really happy that that people want to pay me to do that because I, I have been and, and do it, I have been doing it without pay for, for a few years. So so it's very nice. It's, it's nice getting paid for what you do and feeling appreciated. It, it, it is. It's very nice. It makes such a difference. Um, I, I didn't get fully activated until this year, I would say. Fully activated. That's, that's a, yeah. That's a yeah. Cool like, way to put it. Uh, I started out, I got out of the Marine Corps and I remember this conversation I had with the master guns who was like telling me, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Like talking me into reenlisting. Mm. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to be an artist, you know? And I said it with like all this, like I had this idea in my head of what that meant, right? I'm going to be an artist, right? And and she she looked at me like I was dumb, and she said, "But what are you going to do?" <laughs> and I was like, "Um, I'm going to be an artist." You right. know? Like that, that was my only answer. I didn't have a comeback. I I didn't have a comeback at the time, you know. But uh, now I would have said you know, sell interior wall decor. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. But I, I think, I think Katie, that you do so much more than that. You, you connect people through your work to a deeper understanding of what it is to be human. You know, that's, that's what I feel. That's what I've gotten out of your art. There's, there's, it's an interesting thing because for a lot of artwork, and I think metaphysical artwork does this a lot, there's this very, it has this duality of being very specific yet universal. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, like your, and I keep, I keep seeing that piece of yours and I don't know what it's titled. And I know you've told me numerous times, but it's the guy crawling up the, the stairs with the closer. The, yeah, it's called closer. Yeah, nice. And and so I mean that's very very specific. I mean the imagery, and I, it's it's this guy, and there's a sun brain, and it's I mean just like all of these very specific images, but there is this universal universal like feeling to it that that connects. Like I have felt aspects of that i have felt that way that i'm yeah. getting from that guy climbing up and yeah some of know, the artwork there's... is special that's one of the special ones where i'm i'm not really responsible for that image i'm responsible in, in, in the sense that i had the skill and did the deed of putting it on canvas but the image itself it just popped into my head when I, you know, I, I stood up too fast. My blood sugar was low. I passed out and I hit my head. And when I woke up, the sun was in my face 
And um, I had that vision. And when I, when I, as I was pulling myself up from the cement, I felt like my, I felt like my fingers were connecting into the ground like roots. I just remember the way it felt trying to get up as though I was pulling myself out of, uh, out of, um, roots out of a root system. Wow. That's awesome. You know what, that, that totally reminds me of back to the future when doc Brown slips and falls and hits his head. And when he comes to, he has the idea of the flux capacitor. <laughs> Like you just, you had this vision and, and that's, and, and this, what, what you were saying, like, makes me think, and I've heard, I've heard people say this and I'm not sure necessarily how I feel about it because it's one of those things that like, I, I could definitely be, it's a pretentious kind of thing to say to a certain degree, but like to think of artists kind of as conduits for you know, these images that, that pop into your head or, you know, that, that you're not necessarily controlling it. And it's not something that you sit down and you're like, I am going to formulate this painting and paint this thing. And this is exactly what you don't map it out necessarily. You just kind yes, of get Yes. In that. many ways you, you, your whole being and body become a mechanism for the universe to communicate something. Right. Right. And I that's, think that that's, that's what it's like. I yeah. mean, it's, 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 it's a very like highly narcissistic thing to think, <laughs> you know, like I am, I am the hand that is speaking for God or however you want to put it. That's right. essentially what we're getting at, which is right. insane. Right. That's insane. But well, if you I think mean, about but... it, it's insane, but that's what's happening. Yeah. I mean, completely you're having these experiences you're having an experience in your life no matter who you are and you're finding a way like you're as a visual artist your your entire like focus is in uh communicating something about that experience and it doesn't matter which part you pick mm -hmm if you're able to successfully communicate what you're going for, then you, it has a ripple effect. Oh, completely. Because everybody else who could relate to that experience is then excited. Right. right. And that's, and that's that universal aspect of it. It's, it's yeah. the other, it's, it's that it's relatable and anybody else who, who can relate and connect to that is also you know, tapping into that. And, and that's what's, that. What's connection. really weird is when you think about how it is that music is so powerful, mm. you know, a sad song, like most of us agree if a song sounds sad or if a song sounds joyful or if a song right. sounds like energetic or whatever, motivational or whatever, inspirational or, or, you know, if we, and, and most of us agree as to, uh, as even if we may not like the song, the fact that we we'll, we can acknowledge that a song is beautiful. Right. Right. No, we need Morgan to talk to us about this. I know. Because, because <laughs> We're this missing is, this him. This is something that's really interesting too. And the, and the, the, the way music hits us and, and, you know, the, the, and, and I know I actually, I, I worked with a musician for a long time. I worked with him at a cookie shop. It was really interesting that we both, and it was me and another visual artist and um, this other guy who was a musician. And we all kind of came and this was, this was when we were young and, and our, our art was our side gigs. You know, we all were, were working at this cookie shop as, as our paychecks. Um, but all doing our art and um, Kevin was his name. He would bring his music in and play us his music. And he would always 
bring really interesting music. And he introduced me to so much music when we were working there. And he made an observation at some point because occasionally, like I would say, oh, I really like this song. Who, who sings this song? And he would tell me. And he made an observation after a time. He's like, you know, I think you like everything that you have brought up and asked, said you liked and asked who it is, is in a minor key. Yeah. And I was like, me what too. does that mean? And so he was, <laughs> he was explaining it to me. And it's fascinating because songs in a minor key. And I really want Air, uh, Morgan to, to watch this and because I could be totally wrong. Um, but songs in a minor key, typically, I think people think of as being more melancholy. Yes. And, and it's so interesting that like, that is the music that I connected to. And that was like, unbeknownst to me, like, I didn't know that it was a minor key. I didn't know that that was, that those songs sounded so much. So I similar. also, I also connect more to the minor. Yeah. And so it's, the major. It's, it's really interesting how emotionally those things can hit you differently. And like I'll yeah. hear I'll hear music in a major key and acknowledge, oh, I like that song or it's beautiful or whatever, but it doesn't make my body resonate mm. the way that a minor key does. Right. Right. And that that is is like, you know, visual art as well. There are the, whatever the equivalent to a minor key in visual art is, that that resonates with certain people. There are people who will look at a certain style of art and connect with that certain style of art and that will resonate with them and that that will make them feel that tingly thing and then they'll look at another piece of art that is you know whatever the major key is and and just be like okay i acknowledge that that takes skill or that it's a good painting but meh and so yeah. it's, it's really interesting that that those those things, but you're right. Music has such a huge emotional effect. And I think we connect to music on such a, a deep level. And, and it's so tied to memory also, like for so many songs, if you hear it, you remember exactly where you were, what you were doing, how you felt, what was happening and who you were with the first time you heard that song or, the the it it like solidifies as like this emotional moment that that that's why everybody has you know couples have their song and you know we have these these memories tied to these songs i don't i can't think of anybody right now a, a couple that has like oh that's our painting <laughs> you know, like you don't you don't like connect on that level and and there's just there's something about music and there's something about songs that that just connect on that visceral level. Yeah, yeah. There are there are couples who have paintings, but really, that's awesome. Oh, oh yeah, oh, I yeah. think that I'm. Yeah, I've been, I mean, I've, I'm sure I'm sure there are. I, I've I been don't commissioned know many a time. That's uh, awesome. What kind of what kind of stuff do they commission? Uh, my favorite piece was called Home, and it was based on a poem that the that was important to the two of them. So the, as a couple, they had a piece of poetry, and it was a poem about sitting under a tree with a bottle of wine and a book together. And um, they wanted me to take that poem and do my version and my style of that. And that's the piece called Home, where the space people are sitting in the tree. Oh, neat. And they're holding hands, watching the sunset. So I put them each in, in two different trees because the message is that home is where our hands meet. Oh, that's really cool. I yeah. like that. I like that a lot. I think that's a much more interesting and significant um you know painting for for them as as a couple's painting rather than just like a straight up portrait like i know a lot of people have like you know this is this is our the portrait of us which makes a lot of sense because it's it's a visual portrait representation of the two of them so of course that 
that would be their painting. But I, I like that your, your interpretation is, I think it's more significant because there's a story behind it. There's this poem and there's this connection that they already had and you interpreted it into this visual piece of art that although it's not a straightforward, you know, just a portrait of these two people, it is specifically their painting. It is yeah. nobody else's painting oh, yeah. and they don't have a, a connection to it. So I think that's really cool. Yeah, it was a fun project. I, I, I'll never forget how they lit up, how, how um, the missus, how her face lit up when we pulled the, when we revealed the painting. Oh, she nice. Was like, that's <laughs> like awesome. that. That's right. Awesome. So it was, it was, it was a really, it was a good moment. That must, that's wonderful. Moment. I'm so glad that you were able to have that moment, that feeling it, when, when, especially like with, with a commission, because you do have, like, if you have a piece of art that you've already painted and someone connects with it on a visual, vis, blah, 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 visceral level and they really like it, it, it's awesome when someone gets excited about a piece of yours. But when you have specifically done something, a commission piece or something for someone and their reaction and, and you know, that, that approval from them in that way uh, just feels so good. So yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that more so than anything as an artist is the, is, is the drug, is, is, that, is that connection and approval and, and you know, from, from the person for whom the piece is for, for whom the yeah. piece is for, that's not right. It's like, well, with, with commission work, with commission work, right. That, that approval is like golden. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, because you're, you're doing it for them. And so of course, you know, you want, you want them to, to love it and be like, yes, I am. I'm so glad I picked you to do this rather than like, Oh, damn. I, I shouldn't have put down a deposit already. <laughs> sort this of isn't thing. what I was going for. Right. Or could you like change this completely? <laughs> right. Well, and see, that's, that's an interesting thing too, as, as an artist and as a business person, it's, it's, it's hard to a lot of times to separate your feelings from the business. And I remember yeah. There was definitely a time, and I've had to get over this, there was definitely a time where I felt, because I'm so connected to the art that I make, when I, when I am creating something and when I make something, it's, it's a piece of me. And, you know, so it, it's very vulnerable to be putting these, these pieces out. And so all of the stuff that I create is, is part of me. So if someone criticized it or if someone didn't like it, it was, they were criticizing me or they didn't like me. And so, you know, especially I think for a lot of artists starting out, it's, it's very hard to not take it personal. And like when you're, when you're jurying into a show or you want to put your stuff in a gallery or you're doing a commissioned piece, you know, it's, if, and I remember this one time specifically when, um, I was working with a greeting card company and they really, really liked my work and all of this stuff. And we, we, they had commissioned a piece for me and they liked it a lot. And then they commissioned a, a bunch of other pieces from me and um, like halfway into it, they decided to go in a different direction professionally. Like they just decided to, that they wanted to go in a different direction, which is fine professionally. That's like, they don't know me. I don't know them. I don't know their business model or what they specifically are wanting to do. And so professionally, I really had to like get over it to a certain degree and, and know that they weren't. Not take think, it personally. Right. They yeah. weren't, they weren't personally dissing me. They weren't saying that my art wasn't good or I wasn't good or, or they didn't like me or I was doing anything wrong. And you, you have to, I think, I think you have to, as an artist, at some point, get a, a thicker skin in the professional realm. Well, if yeah, that's what you have to do as a professional in any field. 
Right. And I think it's, it's, it's because artists are this, um, we have a range, we have a really wide range of entrepreneurs, right? Uh, from, um, um, you know, street, street selling, street, street side selling hippies to, uh, professionals in a suit at a gallery show or something, right. you know, we have a really wide range of professional representation and entrepreneurship and what that all means. And, um, it's not, it doesn't, it, it doesn't come with a formula. You know, it was Pi Luna who told me that, um, visual artists are pretty new as entrepreneurs and, yeah. and as, as a, as a business model, because for so many years we were simply sort of wholesale product providers and art galleries would, would buy our work at wholesale cost and resell it for twice the cost. Yeah. And then that went, that, that business model changed from, having it on consignment. And well, and way back, you know, we were, there were, there were patrons and you, yeah. know, you, you basically were tied to a, a patron who would tell you what to paint. And you were just on tap painting. And who was to paint. funding the project. And right. it was a lot to fund everything right. from developing the materials that you're going to use to create the painting to the substrates and, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. They, they had an entire workshop to make everything because they did. It's not like they had a Michaels, right? <laughs> True. They had to be chemists and, and creatives and you know people pleasers and they had to produce and all of this stuff and so it's 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 really strange because in the in the 21st century in the digital age it's uncharted territory for a lot of of the professional artist world and and the business models are still like all over the place i remember yeah. in in just the, the, you know, a decade ago, uh, 15 years ago, the model in school going through art school was still this old model that was like, okay, you're, you're in art school learning art history and learning all of this technique. And your job is to learn how to critique and schlep your stuff to galleries and get gallery shows to beef up your resume so that then you can go to grad school and then ultimately become a professor and just like churn over this, this, you know, kind of thing or, you know, be just work towards getting a patron or just work towards getting into that major gallery. And, but then there's, it's like, a there's, Disney then there's those of us who are like, just make the work right like and, the vision and, pops into your head you are your own patron you need to right. fund it right and then you need to find some then you need to put it on the market and make something from it at some point right well and that you have to find your audience yeah because yeah. there are people who will connect with it there are people who will see you know that universal aspect of it and, and feel that um, connection to it and that, that relating to it and it will touch them in a certain way and they exist out there. And thankfully in the digital age, in the age of the internets and all of that, they're much more accessible. And so you can find your audience. You can be from, you know, Albuquerque and maybe your audience is, more coastal maybe the the biggest audience you have is is going to be in indonesia you know like 
and and you are able to connect with them and find those people and well and it's it's changing the scene completely because now patrons are learning that they can have direct access to creatives and right. that's what everybody wants you know right. they want to be in the they 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 want to know you oh totally well it's interesting too cuz this goes back to you know, we've we've had quite a few TikTokers on uh, the Wet Stuff podcast recently and talking about patrons having direct access to to the artists and, and the fact that TikTok is a now a legitimate um, art representation. And and these artists are live up there showing their work, connecting directly with their audiences and so many TikTokers then gain either they'll they'll directly sell from from showing their work on their TikTok or they will get commissions from from showing their work. And so that's like right there you're connecting with a patron, getting a commission and and you know cutting out the middleman of any type of uh going through a third party to represent you in a gallery or having a marketing manager to, to figure out who your audience is and market to them. You're directly marketing to your audience and they can contact you directly. So, I mean, that's, that's a whole new business model that is now being implemented and utilized. And it's, it's such an interesting thing to see all of these different business models being put out and used and, and, successful yeah i also like the patreon business model yeah where you uh you you deliver some activity or product consistently every month in exchange for uh subscriptions right right so that's that's in in a way i mean that's that's commission these people are are and they are patrons. They're paying you to produce content every yeah. month. Yeah. And that's and why it's called Patreon. <laughs> there you go. It's so simple. Um, and, and that is a really good business model. You know, I would really, I think it would be really cool to interview someone who has a, um, Really, who's been really successful on Patreon and has used- we are that that's John Sumro coming up. Uh, we need to uh, get him back on the schedule. Yeah, we, I, he's one we had to uh, reschedule. So yeah, I mean Sumro is always fun to talk to, and yeah, you know to to talk to him about how he is utilizing Patreon and um, the the different levels that he's doing and how he is uh, working in producing that content monthly. Um, and then the other um, modes of uh, platforms, the other platforms he's using to get his, ta his uh, content out. Oh yeah. So yeah. that would be really cool. Yeah. I know it's a little early, but man, I am pooped. <laughs> All right, let's wrap it up. I think I think we've we've covered quite a lot of ground, and it's always fun to talk about this stuff. But my brain is starting to unravel at uh, almost 10 p.m. on Sunday evening, having to get up and start the week. Um, do you have any goals for this week, Katie? Yes, I do. Uh, Give me a goal. <laughs> uh, I need to get a payment out to you and a payment out to Lady Jen D for your sales in the Metaphysical Art Gallery. Woo woo! That's yeah, nice. you got to get that done. Money uh, is always a good motivator. I've got to uh, finish building the Wet Stuff Podcast website. I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, like today, like the website is, is trucking along. Um, it's, it's, it's in, in pretty good shape, but I have some episodes to update to add. Nice. I would like to, this is making me 
want to dig in and do some Patreon research and reconfigure my Patreon and kind of revisit um, the different levels of subscription and figure out what uh, content that I want to be releasing regularly. And I need to get back on TikTok and start that up again. I kind of left it by the wayside. And <laughs> um, I also um, need to work on some commission work for uh, a friend who is opening a speakeasy, which is really interesting um, that we're, we're on Sunday speakeasy and, um, and that's happening. So um, I very much want to have him on, uh, on the wet stuff. Dana Kohler is one of my oldest and dearest friends. Um, and he is working on this amazing project, which is a nonprofit organization that helps sustainable business models and um, as well as a bar and speakeasy that is 20s, 1920s themed. So that should be really cool. I'm working on doing artwork and murals for him with uh, my business partner, William Wooten of Pigment Pushers. And hopefully we'll be able to schedule uh, some painting classes here before the end of the year. All right. So Those are good goals. Sweet. There we go. Hopefully I'll be able to accomplish <laughs> at least one of them. <laughs> we'll see what the week holds. All right. I got a whole list of goals, like tasks, really. That tasks. I need to get there you done. go. There you go. All right. Well, have a good night, Katie. Have a good night, everyone. Hope your weeks are spectacular. Nice. We'll see you.